What's up guys, Rick from DFS On Demand here with the GC Cup preview, review, I guess it's the preview for the Valspar, review of the Players' Championship. Uh, another tough week for us, we've been middle of the road in these contests nearly every week. Sometimes we fall on the right side of the cut line, barely. Sometimes we fall on the wrong side of the cut line, barely. Uh, last week, the Players was the wrong side, so we ended up finishing, here's the lineup, 86th. Um, you know, I think the top 70 get uh, get points in this for, you know, very similar to the, the PGA Tours FedEx Cup standings. Um, this is a team that, you know, we really whiffed on the two chalk, right? Paul Casey, 36% owned, um, misses the cut after dunking a couple into the water on uh, 17 on Thursday, never really recovered. Uh, Rafa Cabrera Bayo just actually played much worse just in general, right? He was five over uh, on Thursday, four over on Friday, never really uh, did much of anything. So having two guys that finished basically dead last is obviously not going to be good for any lineups. I'm actually shocked we finished 86th here and not any worse. Um, the good parts of this, you know, we had enough of, of Sergio, we had enough of, of Kucher, uh, both guys top 25 this for all intents and purposes. Sergio made a lot of birdies along the way. Kucher missed a lot of really uh, a lot of putts that could have moved him up. It was a, a kind of a, a weird, just just seemed to stall out constantly. Uh, Molinari did eventually make the cut, but did not do much more than that. But you'll notice even, even with, uh, you know, being T56, he only finished, what, four and a half points behind Kucher, who finished T26, um, which is actually pretty interesting to see. That birdie streak helped. And uh, other than that, what else did he do? Really nothing else. It's just uh, that birdie streak really helped out there. They had the same number of birdies, same number of eagles. Uh, Molly made a few more, a few more bogeys and doubles, but uh, that birdie streak really, really helped. Um, as far as ownership percentages, this 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 lineup essentially uh, continues our path of basically having all six guys between like fifteen and thirty percent, which I think is a pretty good strategy for um, a hundred and forty one man contest. Uh, the winner, Miller Time, uh, also had... So this is actually pretty interesting. So let's go to the head-to-head -head view here. Let's see if I can do this. Um, we had three of the same players as the winning lineup. Okay, so Tommy was in the winning lineup. Sergio was in the winning lineup. And Matt Kuchar was in the winning lineup. The differences for Miller Time... Uh, was Hideki who made the cut on the number and then went absolutely nuts on the weekend, 66, 67, 11 under on the weekend, which is exactly why you get studs like that, right? Because even Justin Rose kind of did something similar where even if you're not necessarily playing well, you're never out of it in terms of like birdies and like backdoor top tens. We've seen Kucher actually do this for years where he backdoors his way into a top 10 after starting out you know, not, nothing really special. Um, and then they had Poulter for a T56, which again is kind of just like a, a filler lineup. Our, our, our Molly pick also finished 56, but you'll see Poulter did it with 20 birdies and Eagle and a bunch of um, double or, you know, a couple doubles, a bunch of bogeys, uh, a double or worse. So uh, both finished T56. Poulter scored uh, 10 and a half more DraftKings points, which makes a big difference. And then Adam Scott was Miller Time's final uh, final play here. So let's see, do I have their ownership? Actually, I think I have to go back. Uh, stand by here. Yeah, here we go. So Miller Time, also a very, very similar approach. All six of his guys between 11 and 33%. He did not have like a 1% Johnny Vegas or anything like that. Just a very solid, evenly built lineup where he found a lot of birdies um, along the way and got all six through, which was important. Um, and I've kind of been thinking, you know, philosophically about this where I wonder if weeks like the players where the pricing gets really, really soft if that's better or worse for better players or, or, or I guess, is it better or worse for casual players? <clears throat> and my thought process is, you know, you're able to make so many better lineups because the, the pricing is so soft, but also the general public is available and uh, able to make a lot of really good lineups with the pricing really soft. Um, 
weeks like this where we head to the Valspar and there's only a handful of like well-known entities to the general public in the field, um, you really have to find the value plays or, or be a little bit sharper, I think, in my opinion. So I, I think weeks like this, we probably have a little bit of an advantage. Um, before I jump to this week, just very quickly, season long, I think we were in 94th last week. We're in 99th now. The top 125 are going to make the playoffs. Um, plenty of tournament left. The, the segment two just started a few weeks ago, so plenty plenty there. Um, so let's take a look at what we're going to do for this week at the Valspar. Here's the lineup for this week, and um, I grinded really hard on this. I had a pretty difficult time making lineups. I, I would have loved to have gotten DJ in this lineup, um, but I couldn't find a build that I liked with it. I even went with Hank Lebiota at $6,100, but when I went with DJ and Hank, again, I, I had to fill it out with like a bunch of $7,500 guys, and I didn't really think there was enough value down there. So what I opted to go with and what we have found success in, in in my cash games and a little bit of success here in the GC Cup is kind of a much more balanced build. Um, so I think the, the the first question you should be asking is like, why Lebiota? Um, so for me, you know, he's made a handful of cuts recently. He's, he's nearly min price. Um, he has gained strokes T to green in something like 68% of his rounds that he's played on tour this year. He's played 19 rounds on tour. Um, that's a pretty elite number, especially for guys at $6,100. So his T to green, green game gains on the field much more often than he loses to the field. Um, which was enticing at $6,100. He was one of the, the best options under like $7,000. Um, so I plugged him in instead of kind of going with the, um, I think his name's Ake. Uh, there's a lot of hype around this kid uh, and like Straka at 6,200. Like there's a couple of other players or I think it's right here. Yeah, Akshay Batia. I don't know how to pronounce that. Um, this is his first start uh, as a pro on the PGA tour. So like he's getting like, like, so if I'm going to, my point being, if I'm going to play a guy down here for 6,000 or $6,100, I want someone who has um, shown it on the PGA tour a little bit. And Lebiota has, has done that. Sung Jay, I'm going to buy back in on after uh, the miscut last week. Outside of that, he's, he, he's been really, really good. A handful of top tens, top 15s over the course of the last two months. Um, you know, just, playing well enough at $7,700 in this field. Uh, Russell Knox, similarly, playing well enough, has a good course history. And then we get into the, kind of the elite guys that I wanted to play. Um, and these were very much T to green options. Um, Gary Woodland has been excellent T to green, probably should have won the Tournament of Champions if Xander didn't just absolutely just steal it from him by shooting, what, a 62 on Sunday or something like that. Um, also, Woodland on less than driver courses, which this probably will end up being. Um, has kind of been his bread and butter, right? He's just super solid. Uh, I, I think he's a really good anchor of this lineup. Um, Coke Rack, I'll skip Reed for a second. Coke Rack, to me, is one of these guys who might be playing over his head, but has been so, so good. Like, unbelievably good. Like, his T to green numbers, I think we're only second um, since January 1st to, to DJ. Uh, he's $8,600. You know, he had a T 47 at the masters, but he's got, you know, he's just cranking out top twenties. This is a much softer field. Uh, I'm hoping that he just continues to fire darts as he's, as he's been doing over the last few months. And then Reed is the guy that I talked about a lot on the DFS preview. Reed is kind of like my investment this week. He's the guy that I really think can win this, um, played great T to green last week, punted five strokes, uh, on the greens, losing them on Sunday last week, which is probably one of the worst rounds of his career. Um, I don't envision that happening again. S really good course history. He has two second place finishes here. He has a seventh place finish here. So he's kind of been the guy that I've just been investing a lot of my capital in this week. So I, I felt the need to get him into this lineup. I also considered and tried to get Paul Casey into this lineup. Um, I would have, again, like I said, I would have loved to have get D DJ into this lineup. I would have loved to have gotten Keegan Bradley somewhere in this lineup, but um, there are stands that we had to make, and this is where I ended up. Uh, let me know what you think, especially down in that $6,000 range. Are you playing anyone down there under, let's call it 6,300? Um, and if so, who is it? 
Uh, let me know. You'll see this. This will launch um, at Lineup Lock a Thursday morning, and we'll talk about it then. All right, guys. Good luck.